I, um, I have family that have gathered in uh, Ohio, and so I know that they're watching, and I just want everyone to know that I don't need Christmas because I already married the best Christmas present I could get. That's right. And um, I have to be really nice because tomorrow morning I'm flying in, and I need somebody to pick me up at the airport. <laughs> so, and besides, I want to get there because I have uh, my niece. She had a little baby. His name is George, and I get to play with all his toys tomorrow. <laughs> so it's going to be great. Hey, there was this uh, father with his little daughter, and he was trying to impress upon her the, uh, just their family heritage. And so he sat down with her one day, and he says, Honey, you know dad's a teacher, right? And she said, yes. And he said, well, your grandfather was a teacher. And your great-grandfather was a teacher. And your great-great-great-grandfather was a teacher. And she looked at her father and she said, wow, we come from a long line of grandfathers. <laughs> yeah, we do, actually. I think we all come from a great line of, great long line, right, of grandfathers. As part of our history, it's why we are who we are. Chances are, those of you who are, there's a bunch of you probably, this Christmas, under your tree, there's going to be a little box of 23andMe, <laughs> or Ancestry.com, right? And it's a way to go back and find out something about what is in your background. When you open up the Bible, and you turn to a pages like uh, the Gospels that begin to unfold the story of Jesus. It's trying to do that for you. Only in the Scriptures, we're told that God prepared the time before his son would be born. So like you and I, we want to look backwards and find out where we came from, how, how our stories got to where they are today. But God is telling us from the beginning how he was at work and how he's moving. And so today, I want to pay, take a passage of Scripture that's found in the opening chapter of the book of Matthew. It's a genealogy account of Jesus. Now, I know you're thinking, like, really? Like, genealogy? Well, my wife had the same response. Like, we were sitting around one night. She said, what are you going to preach on Christmas Eve? And I said, well, I, I'm thinking about doing a sermon on the genealogy. And she looked at me, and she went, like, Really? Like, really? It's, there's a lot of really good things in there, and um, I'd, I'd like to just take a uh, few moments with you th this evening and kind of make these stories a little bit more applicable to where we are today. Matthew is going to try to make a case. He wants everyone to know that this promised Messiah, that for centuries and centuries and centuries, that people have always been looking to, this promised redeemer that God was going to send was finally come. And it was important how he came because in this culture, all these prophetic promises were made and it had everything to do with where you were from and what was your, what was your heritage. You, you had to come from a royal line if you were going to be king over Israel. You also had to be a descendant of Abraham, who is the father of all the faithful. So it's no surprise then that when you open up the Gospel of Matthew, this is the text that you read. It says, here is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, just to give you a little bit of a background on that, this Christ is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Messiah. And it was a hope that Israel held strongly. They always looked for this deliverer that God would send. There's a passage that's written in Isaiah chapter 61, 600 years before the birth of Jesus. And I want you to read along what it says. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, and to comfort all who mourn. If you go to the Gospel of Luke, this very verse is quoted 
Jesus reads it one day in the synagogue, and when he opens up that scroll and he reads it, he closes the scroll and he looks at it, those who had gathered, and he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your presence. And everyone who heard it understood that he was claiming to be God. They wanted, some wanted to kill him because of blasphemy, but others were intrigued by what he had to say. The fact that he came from David is no coincidence either, because if you go back even further than Isaiah, you come to a book called 2 Samuel, and Samuel the prophet was the one who anointed David to be king. There comes a time at the end of David's reign where Samuel will once again come and visit him, and these are words that Samuel shares with David. He says to the king, he says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. That's what God, through the prophet Samuel, said to David. There will always be one who sits on David's throne, that his kingdom will have no end. So for the Jews, they understood that this Messiah, if he was going to come, he was going to have to come through the line of David. And there's also this covenant promise that God made with Abraham. Further back than Isaiah and Samuel the prophet, and only this time, this is what it says. These are days long before Moses and all of those fantastic stories. But there's this passage in Genesis 12 where God would take Abraham, and he told him this. He says, the Lord said to Abram, he says, leave your country your people and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. There's gonna come a time in uh, Abraham's life when God is going to repeat this promise to him again. It's after that story of Abraham and Isaac God takes him outside and he points to the skies and he says, Abraham, look up at the sky. I promise you that your descendants will be no more numerous than the stars in the sky and in the sand on the seashore. That was a great promise. And so everyone now goes back and they see this covenant that God made with Abraham that he would bless all the peoples of the earth of this legal right to that claim to be king as a result of being born in this line. And so when you open up this book, you realize that Matthew is serious. He's going to set his case. But now, as I mentioned to you, God, he, he knows the end from the beginning. So he's looking for that perfect time, those, that, that where the setting is, 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 is just right for him to come. And while generation and generation were praying for it, it said, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. And that day arrived. And so that's why Paul, uh, the, uh, the apostle um, Matthew here begins to write for you who was involved. And I think it's instructive, and I'm just gonna share a couple of stories about this so that maybe it'll just stick with you a little bit after our service today because God is going to tell you a little story on how his son came to be born. Now, this is a passage that you might, if you open up to Matthew 1, verse 2 through 6, there are three stanzas, and they're each about 14 names. I think they did that on purpose so that people could memorize that. But here was what we read. It says, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and it'll go on this way. But when you read this text and you begin to realize that God is about to demonstrate how he works in history, he picks a man named Abraham. Now Abraham comes from a town called Ur of the Chaldees. 
I put this little map up to give you just a little indication where that is. You can see the Sinai Peninsula, the Dead Sea, and um, that's where Israel is. You have this Iraq and Iran, right? Those were the towns, uh, at one time Babylon took it over and then the Persians took it after them. But during this period of time, you see all the way down near that Persian Gulf, there's this, there's this town there, it's called Ur of the Chaldees. It was no doubt a pagan city. What was it particularly attractive about this man Abram that he would bring him and make such a covenant promise to him? We don't really know, but it's God's choosing. And as I read to you in the scriptures, he tells him, look, I want you to leave your country and I want you to come into a land that I'm going to give to you. I'm going to bless you, not only with land and posterity, but you're going to be a blessing for the entire world. And to this day, people still count it a blessing to be numbered among those who are children of Abraham. But it goes on from there. He says, Abraham gave birth, became the father of Isaac. Isaac's an interesting story, right? Because Isaac had a brother. His name was Ishmael. Only Abraham, thinking that God was too slow on the promise, decided that he was going to help him out. So he took his wife's concubine and had a child with her. His name was Ishmael. But God said, no, the promise was going to come through Isaac. Ishmael became the father of all the Arab countries. You think there's a little tension to this day between the sons of Isaac and the sons of Ishmael? Do we not still read about this in the papers, in the days in which we're living? People take this very seriously. Isaac, he would have sons. You have twins, actually. It was Jacob and Esau. Esau technically was born first, but the blessing came through Jacob. And one day, Jacob will supplant his brother. In fact, Jacob actually means deceiver, a twister, a supplanter, because he tricked his brother out of the blessing of being firstborn. Nice guy, right? But these are people, flawed people, that God's using in establishing his history. And then he goes to Judah because Jacob had sons, right? He actually had 12 sons and a daughter. But those 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. They defined the nation of Israel. But Judah's not the firstborn. Judah's like the fourthborn. And Judah is no prize. In fact, none of the brothers are. That's why they, they're all listed here in this genealogy. It says Judah and his brothers because people understood that that, that defined the whole nation of Israel. And if you remember, one of those brothers was Joseph. And they, sold, they beat Joseph up and left him for dead. And Judah's the one that comes back. He probably participated, but he didn't feel really good about this nice guy, right? So he comes back and rescues Joseph by selling him into slavery. So he's a really prince of a guy too, isn't he? But isn't it interesting that when you read through this list, it comes all the way down to King David. And David reigned as king. It was a high mark in Israel's history. But I want you to look at this same list again, only we're going to switch a couple of names around now. Because instead of looking at the men, I want you to notice that there are four women in this account too, which should strike you as pretty odd, especially for this culture, because women never appeared in, ge uh, in genealogy lists, because it was unnecessary. The blessings didn't come through them, it came through the men, firstborns. And if you didn't have a firstborn, then you went to your brother's firstborn. It came through the men. So it was, it was kind of strange then to look at this list and see that you would have the likes of Tamar and Rahab and Ruth. And we're not even told 
the name of Uriah's wife. But those names, they have stories too. You see, Tamar, she was married to one of Judah's sons. Judah died, Judah's son died. She's afraid she's going to be left without an heir, someone to take care of her. So she seduces her father-in-law, Judah, and that's how they get those children, Perez, right? It goes on, um, and, and you see Rahab. You know the story of Rahab, right? Walls of Jericho, spies come into Jericho, and the city, they come to this place where they're realizing that the Israelites, they're, they're going to come and they're going to attack the city. And they're all concerned. And they found out that there were spies in the land. And isn't it interesting that they would decide to ask Rahab if she knew anything about it? Let's just say that Rahab had a reputation for inviting men into her house. But Rahab makes the list. Rahab, she's the mother of Boaz. Another woman here is Ruth. That's a great story too. Ruth was married to Naomi's son. And Naomi and her husband, Elimelech, they, they left Israel and they went to, to find food because there was a great famine in the land. And while they were in this foreign land, Elimelech dies. And then her three sons die. And so Naomi says, listen, I'm going back. I have no one to take care of me here. And then you have that famous story, right, where, where Ruth tells her mother-in-law, where you lay down, I'll lay down, right? Your God will be my God. And Ruth follows her. And eventually, Ruth becomes part of this story because Ruth will marry Boaz. Only see, here's the thing. This whole thing is supposed to be about the children of Abraham. And so what's a Gentile doing in the middle of the list? And then it, it, can, it tells us that King David was the father of Solomon, and Solomon's mother was Uriah's wife, which is a nice way of pointing out that David had an affair with Uriah's wife. And not only did David have an affair with Uriah's wife, David would wind up creating a ruse so that Uriah was killed. And so not only did he take advantage of Bathsheba, but he wound up killing her husband. And so you look at the list again and you're like, wait a minute. It's kind of like when you do that Ancestry.com and it comes back and you're looking for kings and you find cattle thieves. <laughs> but you see how God uses flawed humanity? There's a, a number of different ways in which the story could go off the rails. But God is the one who is superintending all of history. And why is that important? Because every day, you and I, we're treated to news that's always telling us how everything is going wrong. There's so much tension, so much anxiety, so much, just everything is so volatile, right? Can't even have a normal conversation with people anymore. You wonder, like, who's in charge? Where is this going? How's it going to get any better? Well, let's look at the list. A bunch of imperfect people. And if you don't get any other lesson than this, I hope you catch that God's in control of history. It's his story. And he's working throughout all these lines because he's got a will and he's got a purpose. Can I do just a few other ones? The second paragraph, you find some of these names. Solomon, oh man, he was the wisest king. Had the most money, had the greatest influence. Nobody else in the whole of the kingdom of Israel was like him, but he was the last of the kings that reigned over a unified Israel. And it didn't fare too well for, for Solomon. 
His heart was drawn away. And the book of Ecclesiastes is a great book about how someone who had everything came to a place where he recognized, hey, I can't take it with me. And with everything that I have, still doesn't give me the control that I wish I had. And that's where you get the famous line, right? It says, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. It took the king a long time to come to this place where he said, this is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. It took Solomon a whole bunch of going in and out until he finally arrived to that place. But his son Rehoboam comes, and under him, the kingdom is split. Ten tribes go north, two tribes stay in the south. And you think, all is lost. This hope that God has been feeding to his people for centuries, it's, it's never going to happen. How's it going to happen now? Look what happened to Israel. We're not even one anymore. And then when you follow this list, you look at other names that are on here, and you realize that these are all kings of the southern kingdom, which was the, the, the tribe of, uh, of the, the of, it's called the, you know, uh, of, of Judah. It's the, it's the southern kingdom. These are all their kings, and they're all pretty bad guys. There's a guy here named Manasseh. He offers his child in a pagan worship, and he kills him. Nice guy. He has a son, Ammon, and he's no better. You see how it says at the end here, the father of Jeconiah? Well, his father, Josiah, they had four sons. That was just one of them. The other three, they were all killed by Babylon or Egypt. This was right around the time when God is saying to his people, listen, I'm going to judge you now. The nation of Israel is going to be taken out of this land, and it's going to be scattered throughout all of the empire of the Babylonians. Because God knows how to be just. But you know what he says to them right here at the end? Because you see at the bottom it says they were exiled to Babylon. Right before they go, this is what God says to these people. He says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope in a future. You will seek me and find me if you seek for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. How do we go from the, from the apex of Solomon to being exiled in Babylon. You see, you think it's all lost. But what God is telling you in this story is not only that he controls the story, but God knows how to be just, and God also knows how to be full of grace. And if you study some of those names, you can see how God is doing that for a number of these people. Last ones. There's a third paragraph here, just a bunch of other names. Truth of the matter is, we know something about Sheatiel. Sheatiel, he didn't have any children. So here is this one name that's in this name of Jesus. But Sheatiel was childless. So he looked to his brother, and his brother had a son. His name was Zerubbabel. And he passed on his inheritance to Zerubbabel. Those two names are important because, see, when God brought the nation of Israel back, it's Zerubbabel that winds up building, helping to build the temple. Read books like Ezra and Nehemiah, and they'll tell you about those two guys. They were hard workers. They gave themselves to this work of God. It, it was like a resurgence. God was giving them another chance. And then all these names come in. We really don't know anything about them. 
They're just names on a page. But they live their lives. Their names are listed here. And they tie this all together through this line of Joseph. Well, it doesn't say Joseph begat Jesus. It says Joseph was the husband of Mary through whom Jesus, the Christ, who, who is the Christ, was born. And so this long story ends in God sending a Savior. What a mixed up history. What a people that seem to have such divided hearts. But God doesn't let them go. God exercises his sovereignty. God knows how to hold the just people responsible and at the same time is one who shows grace because what you see throughout these stories, especially in the stories here of Sheetiel and Zerubbabel when he lets them come back into the land, God's saying, look, I'm the God of the second chance. And so these are just names. Why did God use these people? Well, you watch the news, right? The world doesn't change very much. We all worry about where things are headed, what the future holds. Days are filled with such anxiety. Isn't it good for a moment to just be reminded that those who went before us were just as jacked up? That's a theological word. <laughs> but it never means that God's not in control. It doesn't mean that he doesn't use flawed people. It doesn't mean that God can exercise justice and he could also show grace. Because see, God is the God of the second chance, the fat chance, the slim chance, the no chance. So when I open my Bibles and I read a list of names like that, I would recognize that in that last name, that is the one who came and showed us what it meant to live with a heart that demonstrated the love of God unconditionally. Jesus, not a respecter of persons. Jesus, who shows us something of his glory and at the same time something of his goodness. One to whom we turn to And he says, I'm going to take you from this life into the one to come. But you have to bow the knee. You have to recognize that he is the rightful heir of David's throne. And before Abraham was born, he was. And now we're left with this Jesus, Savior of the world, Emmanuel, God with us. You know the curious thing is? It says that in Christ Jesus, we have been adopted into his family. He gave us the right to become children of God. And so that means that you're a part of the story too. Your flawed life, bad decisions sometimes, But if our hearts are set on him, and if we run with any kind of endurance, this race of faith, God is more than willing and able to do a new work inside of us. There's never, ever, ever anyone who is too far away from the hand of God. God's arm is not too short that he cannot save. You want a Christmas message? There it is. From a genealogy. Booyah. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you 
Because behind so many of these names, there are stories that we can relate to. Sometimes we see the ugliness of our own hearts, and sometimes, Lord, we see the magnanimous nature that can only be accounted for because your spirit is alive. I pray, Lord, that, um, that your spirit would have its, its sway in our life, that we would begin to reflect more and more of who you are so that in the world around us they may see this light even in the midst of the darkness and glorify you, our Father in heaven. I want to thank you for coming into a world that was so broken. And yet everything about you, Lord, spoke peace and love and hope. Because of your resurrection, there is a spiritual power that now lives within us that guarantees our resurrection. So we say thank you for in coming into this world and being born, you gave life to men and women from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every people. And we just say thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.